When we have atoms and molecules, we don't just have nuclei, but of course we have electrons to worry about. Those electrons are also charged particles. And if we put the electron density, which we know is surrounding our atom, in the presence of an applied magnetic field, then those charged particles are going to begin to circulate. They're going to orbit around the nucleus. Circulating charges generate magnetic fields. So the applied field B creates orbital motion of the electrons, and that generates an induced magnetic field. And that induced magnetic field is in the opposite direction to the applied field. So the field that our nucleus sees is the summation of the applied field and the induced field. So the nucleus is going to see a magnetic field which is smaller than the field that we've applied to it. And that's actually the key for the first part of NMR spectroscopy. So our energy levels are going to be split according to the local field that's actually present at the nucleus. And the local field is the difference between the applied field and the induced field. If we make the applied field stronger, then our electrons are going to circulate more and more rapidly. And as they do that, they're going to make a stronger induced field. So the induced field is going to be linearly proportional to the strength of the applied field. And so we put constant of proportionality in their sigma, the shielding constant. We can say that the local field is going to be B times the bracket 1 minus sigma. So if there are no electrons there, then sigma is clearly going to be equal to zero. And then the local field will simply be the applied field. On the other hand, you can imagine that if the shielding was entirely effective, then th in that case, sigma would be equal to 1, and then the nucleus would not see a magnetic field at all. So B local would be equal to 0. OK, the reason why this is important is that sigma is clearly a function of the electron density. So we've got a probe of the electron density around each individual nucleus in our molecule. And that's what gives NMR its strength, really. So let's look at a very simple example of that. I'm comparing a CH bond with an OH bond. In the CH case, our proton has got a good amount of electron density surrounding it. That's going to be a well-shielded proton. On the other hand, our greedy oxygen atom here has pulled all of the electron density towards it. It's got a high electronegativity. So our proton here is going to be, relatively speaking, more exposed to the applied field. It's not going to be shielded by the electrons because those electrons have all gone and clustered around the oxygen atom. So here's what we're going to see. In the OH group, the proton feels the applied field more strongly because the electronegative oxygen atom has pulled all of the electron density towards it. That means, of course, there's still some electron density around it, so it's not as exposed as a bare nucleus, but it's less exposed than the CH here. So here we've got increasing exposure, and that correlates with increasing frequency of the transition. Our transition for the proton would be out here, so that would be at the highest frequency. The resonance for the OH would be at the next highest frequency. And then the resonance for the CH would be at the lower frequency. When we do NMR spectroscopy, we don't tune the frequency of our source. We tune the molecule by changing the magnetic field. So when we actually do the spectroscopy, we will plot the signal as a function of an increasing magnetic field. And then we fix the frequency of our photon which is some frequency in the radio wave regions. And that is what we do is change the field. So we move the field along and look for when we come into resonance with this species. And you can see that they're going to be at different points for different molecules. And the first one to come into resonance as we increase the field, so that's where the proton resonance is going to appear. And then as we increase the field a bit more, we get to here. And that's where the OH resonance is going to appear. And then finally, we keep increasing the field and we end up with the CH resonance. So now we can see we've got a spectroscopic technique which is now not measuring the properties of the whole molecule, but now we're looking at signals which are specific to the individual protons in the molecule. So let's imagine we do a low resolution spectrum. We're going to see three peaks, and each one is going to correspond to a different proton here. The methyl proton, methylene proton, and the OH group. And another very useful feature of NMR the intensity of these transitions, that is the integrated area underneath those transitions, is directly proportional to the number of nuclei involved in the transition. So we can see that the one which appears at very low field is a, a single proton, so we can assign it to that OH group. The one which appears in the midterm here, there are two protons involved, so that's the methylene group. And at high field, eventually, we get this CH3 resonance appearing. And that correlates with what we've been saying about the importance of the electronegativity 
of the atoms close by the hydrogen nucleus because this hydrogen here is going to be heavily exposed to the field because the oxygen atom has kept all of the electron density. This guy is still quite close to the electronegative oxygen atom. So the methylene protons are close to the oxygen atom. So they're also going to experience the oxygen atom's electronegativity. So they're going to be relatively exposed, more exposed than the methyl proton, but less exposed than the hydroxyl proton. So that's why they resonate in the middle. And then we get this one resonating a high field because that's the best shielded set of protons.